Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. New on the night beat, a San Antonio grandmother has made it her mission to keep her granddaughter's name alive after she was shot and killed on the west side during what police say was a car meetup. Now, six-year-old Soraya Perez now has a nonprofit organization in her honor. The sole purpose is to help other families who have lost a child to gun violence. Her grandmother tells me helping others has brought their family peace in a devastating situation. I get up in the morning and I come and I give her a kiss. Cynthia Alvarez starts and ends her day with her granddaughter, six-year-old Soraya Perez, not in person, but in spirit. She loved pink, she loved purple. Soraya was shot and killed on Mother's Day during what police say was a dispute at a car meet. The Bear County District Attorney indicted this man, Andrew Ray Elizondo, for felony murder. He's facing up to 99 years or life in prison. We're fine with it, you know, um, but closure we haven't had just yet. Since Soraya's death, it's been tough. A big emptiness in our heart, in our home. Soraya forgives you, but look at what you did to us. But the family has found a way to make good come out of a tragic situation. Soraya was a small child with a huge heart. Her biggest concern and worry was always a child that never had anything. They started a nonprofit called Soraya Liana's Blessings. Its mission for not another child to go through what she went through. Not another child to get gunned down. Not another child to be ever hurt. This is the backpacks that have been donated. They're planning a back to school drive as a first event on the 14th. With each backpack, a letter of encouragement, snacks. She loved her snacks. And for each girl, a pink bow will be given, symbolizing Soraya's love for bows. She hopes her granddaughter's life continues to impact others, even after death. Soraya was blessed to have everything she wanted. So she's blessing other children now. Now that back to school drive will be held at the People's House Church on South Hamilton Street. Now if you will go from 5 to 8 p.m. next Saturday, that's when the event will take place. If you would like to donate supplies or learn more about the organization, visit the story on our website at ksat.com. Taking a look now at other top stories we've been following today. San Antonio police investigating a shooting on the southeast side that left a man in the hospital overnight. It all happened just after midnight off of Lake Tahoe Street, not far from New Sulphur Springs Road and Loop 410. When police arrived at the scene, they say they found a 28 year old man who was shot in the leg, along with several shell casings. That man taken to the hospital. So far, no arrests have been made and no word on any suspects in this case. Also happening overnight, a woman died after being hit by a train over on the south side. This just before midnight on West Hutchins Place near South Zarzamora in I-35. San Antonio police say that woman was pronounced dead at the scene. It's unclear right now why she was on those train tracks. Union Pacific is investigating along with SAPD. Two women are dead and a suspected drunk driver is facing charges after speeding head on into another vehicle. The crash happening after police tried desperately to stop the man as he drove the wrong way. The 19th Jonathan Colto with details on the deadly crash. Not only are we dealing with two families, possibly three families that are just tragically having to walk through some horrible, horrible um, details of what this crash consisted of. Police say at around 2.30 this morning, they spotted a man driving a Ford 350 pickup truck traveling the wrong way on I-37 near downtown. That driver, they say, going around 90 miles an hour, eventually jumping onto I-35 South, but still driving the wrong way. Police say they tried everything to get him off the road, even SAPD's Eagle helicopter was deployed. All efforts unsuccessful. We attempt uh, by traveling on the right side of traffic, our DWI officers uh, attempt to make contact with them by using multiple resources on their uh, patrol unit. They use their floodlight. At one point, they actually did make eye contact with the driver, um, getting his attention without success of having him stop his vehicle. Their efforts continuing for miles and tragically ending at I-35 between Eisenhower and Walzen. Bruneda says the driver struck an SUV head-on, killing the two women instantly. The man's truck bursting in flames upon impact. Officers rushing to rescue the man from his truck, burning and upside down. Police using a fire extinguisher and pulling that man out. We're able, two officers were able to extract him from the vehicle, pulling him a quite, quite the distance and, and potentially uh, and obviously saving his life. 
ASAPD says the officer who pulled the man from the burning truck was treated for smoke inhalation. As for the driver who caused the fatal crash, he was transported to Bamsi in critical condition. Police say he'll be facing two charges of intoxication manslaughter. And as for the two female victims, their identities have not yet been released. Reporting, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. The jury has spoken. We know this was a very difficult decision for them. It was not easy for them to reach this verdict. That verdict, guilty. The punishment, death. After a jury deliberated for more than seven hours yesterday, Otis McCain became the first man to receive the death penalty in Bear County in five years. McCain convicted of shooting and killing San Antonio Police Detective Benjamin Marconi. And now that that trial has come to a close, there's hope that the Marconi family and his brothers and sisters in blue may be able to find some sense of closure. Yeah, the night team's John Paul Barajas spoke with a police chaplain who explains how the trial brought back some emotions and how it's ending will now allow those involved to keep moving forward. The grief and emotions from a tragedy like the killing of Detective Benjamin Marconi often come flooding back during a trial says volunteer police chaplain Ron Leonard. Now they still have emotions and they still have to relive that horrible day that happened out there with it because he was just brutally ambushed is what it was. For the past month, family, friends and brothers and sisters who share the badge have had to see Detective Marconi's suspected now convicted killer front and center of all media outlets. The chaplain explains it's tough, but the sentencing was needed not just to close the case, but to turn the chapter. It was good to get the closure, regardless of what the verdict meant or anything like that. I really don't want to get into that. It's just that it was closure. It's over with now. During times of need, Chaplain Leonard and his therapy dog, Molly, offer emotional support and prayers to officers and their families who need it. His services have been in high demand during the trial. We go out emotionally and help these families and different ones be able to come to grips with what happened. Survivor's guilt, which means why wasn't I the one that was hurt instead of him? Why am I still alive and he's still and he's gone? She's a good dog. He adds right after the sentencing came down, he was in touch with some officers who called to thank him and Molly for their time and support. On top of being there for the officers emotionally, the chaplain has also been giving out these goodie bags with treats inside and a message that says, Dear officer, we need you to show them they're still cared for and appreciated. He says in the last six months, he's given out just under 1,000. John Paul Barajas, KSAP 12 News. John Paul, thank you. Texas Democrats break quorum once again as a second special session called by Governor Greg Abbott convened today with many still missing. A good many of those Democrats say that they will remain in Washington, D.C. in an effort to push Congress to act on a federal voting bill. The previous session ended yesterday without any bills being passed. The new session comes with an expanded list of items added to the agenda by Governor Abbott. They include priorities like the election bill that caused the House Democrats to break quorum in the first place, as well as COVID-19 relief funds, education during the pandemic, and potentially changing the legislative rules regarding quorums. Outside with live cam tonight, beautiful view of downtown San Antonio. Clear skies after just some fair weather clouds this afternoon. And I know it was very warm this evening, but with that breeze in place, it didn't feel too terrible out there. And I hope you were able to spend at least a little bit of time outside today without being drenched in sweat. Uh, temperatures today at the airport morning low of 75 up to 93 this afternoon. That's still four degrees below average for this time of year. And we're going to see temperatures generally hover in the mid to upper 90s for the next several days with very, very minimal rain chances for some of us. We'll talk about that. We're also going to cover what's going on in the tropics this hour. Uh, things are starting to heat up out in the Atlantic base, Basin. We'll also talk about how that plays into the Saharan dust. We'll take a look at the latest outlook there and also get you a look at what's going on with weather across the country. That and more coming up in a bit. Still to come on the night beat, the bipartisan infrastructure bill passed a test vote in the Senate today, but it's not the only hurdle in its way. We'll break down what lies ahead. Plus, the United States adding to its medal count today in Tokyo. We'll take a look back at all of today's events as the Olympics head into the final home stretch. And another day with more than 100,000 new COVID cases. This as many hospitals nationwide are nearing capacity. The latest on the night beat.
The Delta variant fueling an alarming rise in cases. The country now seeing four straight days of more than 100,000 new infections. Florida leading the U.S. in hospitalizations. Here's ABC's Christine Sloan with the details. The U.S. reporting its fourth straight day with more than 100,000 new cases of COVID-19. Florida currently leading the country in hospitalizations. The state's hospital association predicting six in ten medical centers will face critical staffing shortages in the next week. We're bringing in additional staff, additional physicians, opening up nooks and crannies, if you will, in the emergency rooms to find places to see patients. A similar situation in Louisiana. The state's positivity rate now above 15 percent. If this pace continues, their ICUs and their hospitals, uh, they will be turning away patients. Denise Harris of Baton Rouge was hesitant to get the shot, but had a change of heart. I have to set the tone for my kids, for my co-workers that haven't took it because we're not winning out here. In Georgia, parents are concerned as kids return to school. When yeah. you've had family pass away from COVID, you, you don't play with that. Cobb County reporting 185 cases in the first week of classes. Gwinnett County with 166 cases in just the first two days of school. Across the country, the average number of hospital admissions is up by more than 40 percent in the past week. COVID taking its toll in unvaccinated communities. The biggest fear is a variant of high consequence, which would be a variant worse than the Delta variant uh, that could actually be able to overcome our current vaccines and our current remedies. But there is one positive coming out of this rise in infections. All 50 states are reporting more residents are rolling up their sleeves and getting that first dose of vaccine. In New York, Karina Mitchell, ABC News. Taking a look at weather right now, it was quite a beautiful day today. Hot one out there, though. Yeah, it was hot, but it was. I still enjoyed that, though. It wasn't that bad. You were mentioning before the break if you felt the breeze tonight, that was all right. I took my daughter to Six Flags yesterday. Yeah. The breeze was nice a couple times, but we only lasted three rides before we had to go home and <laughs> hop in the pool. I don't blame you at all. It was too hot. I don't blame you at all. Yeah, it's still hot out there, that's for sure. It's still August in South Texas, so we're not uh, breaking out the cardigans or anything like that. Uh, but that breeze in place today will hang around for the rest of the weekend. And again, that breeze just helps that heavy, hot air to just... Keep on moving along just a little bit. Provides a touch of relief. High temperatures today, 93 at the airport, up to 99 in Del Rio, 92 the high in Hondo, also 92 in Kerrville. Elsewhere across the state, they made it up to 100 in El Paso, 96 in Dallas. Really a hot spot here, of course, out in the desert southwest, Vegas down to Phoenix. But uh, southern and central plains, one of the warmest spots across the U.S. today. Uh, we do have a swath of some rain that's working up through the central plains, Oklahoma into Kansas and Nebraska. There was also some severe weather earlier today across portions of Wisconsin. And a couple of tornadoes reported up there. Here's the severe weather risk for today where you see this yellow swath here. That's a two on a one to five scale. And there is some ongoing severe weather from just south of Omaha down through Wichita, Kansas, and into parts of the Oklahoma and Texas panhandle elsewhere. Things are pretty quiet. And that's where there is a dip in the jet stream providing some rain making energy. That's that red you see there uh, moving into the central plains. Here in our part of the world, things are going to stay pretty quiet over the next five to seven days or so mainly because we've got upper level high pressure that will start to build in early middle part of next week. That keeps us high and dry, as we like to say. Uh, so that'll keep rain chances out of the forecast. It will start to move back off to the west toward the end of next week. So we're talking a good seven, eight days from now. That's when we'll start to reintroduce some lower end chances of rain. Uh, some isolated rain will be possible as we get into parts of next weekend. But uh, here in the next again, five, seven days or so, things are going to be pretty quiet as far as the rainfall is concerned. 84 is our air temperature at the airport. Our dew point is in the mid 70s, so that makes it feel like 91 even at this hour. But again, our saving grace has been that breeze. We are very thankful for that because even with a heat index of 91, it 10 15 at night. We've got that steady breeze in place. 83 now at New Braunfels, 80 in Kerrville, still 90 out in Del Rio. And dew points are high everywhere. They've fallen off a little bit across portions of the hill country and out near, near Del Rio, but 60s and 70s, uh, that's some very saturated, humid air. A look at our winds currently. They're still about 5 to 15 miles per hour. They will drop off a bit overnight, so light winds tonight, 5 to 10 miles per hour. But once we get sun up tomorrow morning, Wind speeds will pick back up and we'll have a nice steady breeze in place again on Sunday. Uh, so that makes tomorrow very similar to today. 
few hours of morning clouds and will break through to plenty of sun in the afternoon. High temperatures tomorrow back mid to upper 90s for a lot of us. When you factor in the humidity, it will feel more like 100 to 105 uh, during the heat of the afternoon. So if you want to spend some time soaking up the sun out by the pool or area lakes and rivers, just make sure you keep everyone hydrated. Keep that sunscreen handy as well. I do want to walk you through future cast uh, heading into the day tomorrow. There's not a whole lot to see here. Again, a few hours of morning clouds will break through to afternoon sun. I can't rule out a stray shower, mainly for some of our easternmost counties. I'm talking Quero and DeWitt County, Hallettsville and Lavaca County. That's where there could be one or two little showers that try to sneak in from the coast tomorrow, and that will actually be true through about the middle part of next week. Uh, but that's going to be certainly the exception rather than the rule. And again, that's just for our communities that are south and east of San Antonio here in town. Elsewhere across the hill country west of 35, we are going to be very dry through the middle part of next week and then some lower end rain chances sneak in as we get closer to next weekend. Guys. Yes, I love that breeze, Katie. Thank you so uh -huh. much. Could always be worse. Mm -hmm. All right, Larry Spurs rookie Joshua Primo may look the, all the 18 years that he is. He's got that baby <laughs> face, but man, he's got some skills. He does definitely have some skills and uh, where we're going. Here. I know. I don't want to. It's been two weeks, either. man. What are we doing? One, used to that one, Gerber. By the way, it's nice to have you back. Good to be back. Yes, yeah, Spurs rookie Joshua Primo certainly has some skills, and he is only 18 years old. In his two games in Salt Lake City, young man really put on a show, and Pop was feeling very good after Team USA won the gold medal. Coming up. Guy right there got the converse on. Pop, if you just click gold time, medal game you sneaks. Or you might have to hey, look at that. Lock up. That's what we do, Coach Pop. That is what we do. Yes, sir. Basketball gold medalist Draymond Green posted that video from Japan of a happy Coach Pop playing defense in big board sports. And he still has it. Team USA was all smiles after beating France 87-82 to win the gold medal in men's Olympic basketball, the fourth straight Olympic gold medal for the U.S. Following two exhibition losses in Las Vegas, and then after losing their pool play opener to France, many wondered if the Americans could even win gold, but Team USA never lost the faith. Kevin Durant, who led the Americans with 29 points, loves his gold medal basketball family. When you are part of a team that's, you know, evolving by the second is just amazing to see so each game we continue to grow our coaches continue to get more have more confidence in us the players start to have more confidence in their roles it's just that journey that was just so important you realize you know you finish the job you get the gold medal you get the you know the trophy but when you go through that journey man it's just it's just it's just incredible to, to be a part of something so special and i'm bonded with these guys for life family for life and I'm just grateful that that we all committed to this early and we stuck with it and finished it off. This was a stressful summer for Team USA head coach Greg Popovich. He's often said basketball is a game. You win, you lose, then you go home. But this was different. The Olympic gold medal fills one of the few voids on his long resume. We're, we're thrilled uh, and honored to be able to represent the country the way we did. Uh, the team uh, progressed very rapidly in a very short period of time under some difficult circumstances, which I think made this win all the sweeter. So uh, we're glad it's over. <laughs> Spurs 21-year-old forward Keldon Johnson is now an Olympic champion. KD called him over to center court after the game to make sure he celebrated with the team. Back here in the States, the Spurs close out the Salt Lake City Summer League with an 82-77 loss to the Memphis Grizzlies last night to finish 0-3. Spurs second-year guard Devin Vassell posted a game-high 27 points in 30 minutes of action. He shot 11 for 30 overall and one of 10 from three-point range. Recent first-round draft pick Joshua Primo scored 17 points and was able to show off his playmaking skills. Vassell is impressed with the 18-year-old Primo and has taken him under his wing. Absolutely. He's been great. He's been a great leader on this team. He's been just pushing us all to work harder and then just play free on the offensive end. At 18 years old, to come out here and play with that much confidence. And, you know, I talked to him and, you know, before the game and 
And at halftime, I'm like, bro, just play confident, play your game. And, I mean, he showed everybody that, you know, he's here and that he's ready. Spurs second round pick Joe Wieskamp had seven points and a team high 10 rebounds last night. Spurs will take on the Timberwolves in their first game of the MGM Resort Summer League in Las Vegas on Monday at 6 p.m. local time. San Antonio FC will play at RGV FC tomorrow night at 7.30. San Antonio is at six in the USL Championship Mountain Division, while RGV FC is second, seven points ahead. SAFC goalkeeper Matthew Cardoni is closing in on a franchise record. He has 97 total appearances for the club, second best in team history, and he trails former defender Greg Co Cochran, who appeared in 102 matches for SAFC, so he is getting... Later in sports, the Cowboys and Rams held a dual scrimmage in Oxnard. Guys? We will look forward to it. You ended with soccer. You missed me so much, huh? But I teased football. That's good. You won yourself See? back some points. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, stay with us. The Senate in session today holding a procedural vote on the $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill. Yeah, but that bill is much smaller than what President Biden was hoping for. Here's ABC's Alex Prochet with the details. In a rare Saturday session, the Senate voted to advance the $1 trillion infrastructure package, overcoming their first filibuster by a vote of 67 to 27. It is not the end, and, but it takes us a step closer. The bill includes billions to expand rural broadband, replace lead pipes around the country, invest in rail, bridges and airports, and expand infrastructure for electric vehicles. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell called the bill imperfect but said he believes passing physical infrastructure is a core government responsibility. Republicans and Democrats have radically different visions these days, but both those visions include physical infrastructure that works for all of our citizens. Another vote could occur before the Senate's passage of the bill. So. We can get this done the easy way or the hard way. The Senate will stay in session until we finish our work. It's up to my Republican colleagues how long it takes. The bipartisan bill is still smaller than what President Biden had hoped for, but he thanks senators on Friday for working on a bill he says is essential to his Build Back Better program. 90% of the jobs created by this legislation will not require a college degree, 90%. It's a blue collar blueprint to rebuild America. The bill is expected to pass the Senate, but faces an uncertain future in the House, where several progressive Democrats are unhappy with its limited scope. And after they complete work on the bipartisan bill, Senate Democrats are expected to begin work on a budget resolution package that does not have the support of Republicans. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has said she will not take up an infrastructure bill until the broader budget bill has passed the Senate. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. Taking a look at headlines around America tonight, a New Jersey gym owner and former MMA fighter has pleaded guilty to assaulting a police officer during the January 6th Capitol riot. It marks the first time someone has been convicted of violence against police that day. On Friday, Scott Fairlam uh, also pleaded guilty to obstructing an official proceeding. According to his deal with prosecutors, he could face a sentence of more than three years in prison. He has also agreed to pay $2,000 in restitution for damage to the Capitol. Body camera footage shows Fairlam uh, following and taunting officers and even punching one in the head. 1,600 Americans affected by September 11th terror attack are asking President Biden to release the government's records. The group sent a letter to the president reminding him of a campaign promise to release documents and information about the 9-11 attack. The group does not want President Biden to attend the 20th anniversary memorial ceremonies at Ground Zero in New York if he does not comply. On Friday, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki says the president remains committed to his campaign pledge, but needs the DOJ to take the final steps. Turning to Tokyo now, in this final weekend of Olympic competition, the United States adding to its medal count. That's right, those medals in track, basketball, and golf, among other sports. Here's ABC's Michelle Frazen with the details. In the final track and field event of these Tokyo Olympics, the U.S. women finishing the 4x400 relay with a significant lead, earning them the gold medal. Allison Felix, who ran the second leg of that race, now the most decorated track athlete in American history. This medal gives Felix a total of 11, breaking the tie with Carl Lewis. Yeah, I think it's been a really special game for women, um, you know, in our sport, outside of our sport. 
it's been really inspiring for me to see. And redemption on the track for the U.S. men after they did not make the final of the 4x100 meter relay. In the 4x400 relay, the U.S. men claiming the gold medal. It is the fifth gold for the U.S. men in this race since 1996. It was a close game on the court, but the U.S. men's basketball team is bringing home the gold medal after beating France 87-82. to Still to come, the women's basketball team facing Japan in the gold medal game in just a few hours. Team USA's Molly Seidel ran her first marathon ever in February 2020 at the U.S. Olympic Trials. A year and a half later, she's now the Olympic bronze medalist. In the pool, it's a three-peat for the U.S. women's water polo team, bringing home gold for their third consecutive Olympics after a 14-5 victory over Spain. In the women's golf tournament, 23-year-old Nellie Corda finished 17 under par after four rounds, earning her the gold medal. But the Americans will have to settle for the silver medal in baseball. The Japanese team defeating the U.S. 2-zip to, to win the country's first gold medal in baseball. Michelle Franz and ABC News, New York. Back to school is upon us. And are you taking advantage of the tax-free weekend? Some shopping advice before the kids are back in class. Next. Boy, summer disappeared quickly. Before the kids head back to class, though, many parents head back to the stores, stocking up on markers and folders and maybe a backpack or two. And this year, the retail industry is projecting record spending. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz says you'll likely see higher prices this year, so it pays to do some homework. So long summer, hello binders, backpacks, and all those glue sticks. Brian Garcia's strategy for back to school shopping, just get it done. Honestly, we just buy it all at once because there's no guarantee of a sale. Do the math, this stuff adds up. Families with K through 12th grade kids will spend an average $849 this year. That's $59 more than last year and a record. For starters, most everything is costing more. There's the microchip shortage, which is affecting tech products, especially laptops and tablets. There's also been some pandemic related inflation just on everything overall. Consumer Reports deal hunter Samantha Gordon says there are some sales, but discounts just aren't as big this year. So it's time for a refresher course in Penny Pinching 101. First thing experts say, make a list, make a budget. Before you even head out, shop your house and use leftovers. Of course, look for sales, but ask about student discounts on tech too. Spread it out. You won't need everything like fall clothing the first week. For supplies, try dollar stores and the big warehouse clubs. Maybe even team up with other families in the neighborhood and buy things in bulk and spread out the cost that way as well. And save the tax. This Friday through Sunday, Texans pay no sales tax on most shoes, clothing, and school supplies, including all those glue sticks. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. So I can vouch for the shop your house yeah. part of that. Uh -huh. We had, growing up, we had one cabinet that was all extra school supply stuff. And before we would go shopping every year, my mom made us go through and see what we already had. <laughs> and as a kid, I was like, dang it. But now as an adult, yeah, it makes a whole lot of Hard sense. Hard to believe mine goes back on Wednesday and oh she God. is not ready. <laughs> I, I have a feeling there's a lot of, a lot of that out yes. there. Um, so we've got a busy week coming up. Maybe on your to-do list for Sunday is to get the car all cleaned up, organized, ready to go. You're good to head to the car wash for the next several days without any chance of rain in the forecast really for the next week or so. We'll dive into a look at what's going on in the tropics coming up in just a few minutes. I just want to give a quick plug to our KSAT weather app while we were in Ohio for two weeks. Uh, when it would rain or thunder or lightning, we got all the yeah. alerts for that area specifically. So if you go out of town, <laughs> make sure you have that app working because I, it keeps you informed wherever you go. I learned about that when I went to Florida and we were getting lit up by lightning detected yeah. near you. And I was like, OK, cool. <laughs> awesome. I yeah. wanted to see what was happening back home. and I was like, oh, man, I got to scan all the way back down the map <laughs> to get to San Antonio. That's too funny. Yeah, that's a good feature of the yeah. weather app. You can take it with you. Uh, you'll still get the push alerts from the weather team about what's going on locally, right. but yeah, you can tailor, uh, you'll get the severe weather alerts for wherever you are. So it is a useful tool here at home and when you hit the road. So we're going to start here talking about the tropics, specifically Saharan dust. And you may think, what do the plumes of Saharan dust 
have to do with the tropics. Well, when these big plumes get picked up by the trade winds and move across the Atlantic Ocean, eventually into the Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, that inhibits tropical development. So we typically see a lull in any tropical activity. I'm talking the development of tropical waves, tropical depressions, eventually tropical storms and hurricanes. We typically see a lull in that activity when this dust is, you know, consistently moving across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, um, some good news here with the dust. It's not coming across as fast and heavy as it was even a few weeks ago. Um, so I don't have any of the Saharan dust moving into our area uh, really over the next five to seven days or so. So that is not a concern. Uh, but as those plumes of dust start to uh, slow down just a little bit, uh, now we're starting to see an uptick in what's going on in the tropics, specifically the Atlantic Basin. So what I want to show you here, and this is this is a lot, uh, these are three areas that the National Hurricane Center is watching for some potential tropical development. So uh, potentially becoming our next tropical depression, maybe even our next tropical storm hurricane down the line. So essentially uh, we've got three areas here to watch this first one that's expected to approach the uh, windward and leeward islands over the next few days. Low odds of becoming a tropical depression. It's actually this middle disturbance here that has the highest chance to become at least a tropical depression in the next two to five days. Basically, this is now the time of year where we're going to start really paying very close attention to what's going on into the Atlantic Basin. And if it looks like anything's going to start to wander into the Caribbean, maybe even the Gulf of Mexico, we'll of course keep you updated there. Uh, but that's going to be more than a week from now. So uh, in the short term here, as we have kiddos heading back to school next week, really the only thing you'll have to worry about when it comes to the weather is the afternoon heat. Our afternoon highs will stay in the mid to upper 90s. Uh, no rain chance really next week until we get toward the end of the week, maybe a stray shower as we get into Friday. But otherwise, next week, as some of our kiddos start school, will be pretty quiet. 84 still at the airport. We've still got a decent breeze in place that's helping us out because the high humidity is still making it feel like it's in the low 90s at this hour. 82 in Gonzales, 88 in Catula. And winds are not quite as breezy as they were earlier in the evening and overnight, the drop down to about five to 10 miles per hour. So we will start off the day tomorrow with lighter winds. But as the sun comes up, as we start to warm up, that breeze will kick in once again. And we're looking at sustained winds about 10 to 20 miles per hour throughout the day on Sunday. Some gusts up closer to 25, maybe 30 miles per hour, uh, but those will be pretty few and far between. Overall, that breeze will be nice and steady through the afternoon tomorrow. As we head into our hottest part of the day, that breeze will be there to kind of help us out just a little bit. Otherwise, we will start off with some low morning clouds tomorrow. Temperatures mid to upper 70s, right around 76 here in San Antonio. Some upper 70s off to the west. As we get into the afternoon, any morning clouds will quickly clear up. We're looking at plenty of sun tomorrow afternoon and high temperatures jumping back into the mid to upper 90s, possibly touching 100 from Del Rio, essentially down to Laredo and the Catula area. And again, breezy tomorrow. Uh, no chance of rain here in San Antonio. For some of our easternmost counties, I'm talking really Cuero here in Wick County up to Hallettsville, Lavaca County. You've got the best chance to see a spotty afternoon shower as we get into tomorrow. Uh, rain chances not only tomorrow, but also for the next few days are strictly going to be confined to areas well south and east of San Antonio, mainly down closer to the Gulf Coast. Um, so if you're in some of our eastern and southeastern most counties, maybe a passing shower here or there the next few days, but mainly just hot. That'll make tomorrow a good day to hang out by the pool, soak in those maybe last few hours of summer break for some of our area kiddos. Guys. Yeah, probably have to throw Bo in the water. Yeah. Make him enjoy it for a second. The dogs like it too. <laughs> yes, thank you, Katie. Uh -huh. All right, Thursday, uh, Larry, we got a appetizer of the new football season. It's getting so close now you can almost smell the tailgates. Oh, you can definitely smell the tailgate. They were probably tailgating out in Oxnard today because yeah. the Rams and the Cowboys held a dual practice scrimmage out there. And, of course, there were a couple of dust-ups between the teams. But head coach McCarthy also offered us some insight on Dak Prescott. It appears to be positive news. And UTSA punter Lucas Dean has a great story about his first American football contest. Coming up. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys and L.A. Rams held a dual practice in Oxnard, California today, and fans were in the stands to witness this play. Rams' Kenny Young punching Cowboys running back Tony Pollard while he was out of bounds. A Pollard swung back and then chased him onto the field, and that was pretty much the end of that. Running back Ezekiel Elliott saw some action today, breaking outside, inside, and then outside again on this touchdown run. Now, Dak Prescott did not play, but Coach McCarthy offered up this update.
This is more us than him. You know, this is this is us being cautious. Um, so I feel, I feel really good about where he is. He, he's doing some things, you know, as far as the, the throwing, and so everything's on a rep count. So we'll just see how he progresses. He's yeah. done some throwing. He's done some throwing. Yeah, light throwing, <laughs> light objects. <laughs> Light objects. All right, here's another dust up, and this one involved Connor Williams and Aaron Donald. Look at that. Now, it's also being reported by the Dallas Morning News that the Cowboys will not practice the next three days. Following a Thanksgiving win against Detroit last season, Texans cornerback Bradley Roby was suspended six games for violating the NFL's PED policy. He missed the final five games of the regular season and will miss the season opener at home against the Jaguars. In many ways, the Texans are a much different team this season compared to last, and Roby was asked if he likes the direction of the team. I do. I like the direction. Uh, it's positive. I feel like we're all on the same page. And uh, that's the first thing, you know, the first thing is about being on the same page, everyone working together. And, uh, you know, right now, you know, people aren't saying positive things, but the season hasn't happened yet. No one's lined up yet. Everyone's all American. Everyone is this and that. So, you know, we got to just go out there and do our thing, man. I, I'm positive for the season. I can't wait. Texans players will get tomorrow off and resume camp Monday. The Pro Football Hall of Fame class of 2020 was finally enshrined tonight in Canton, Ohio. 15 were elected as part of its centennial class. The class included such greats as the Steelers' Troy Palomalu, Rams wide receiver Isaac Bruce, former Colts running back Edron James, Steelers safety Donnie Schell, and former Steelers head coach Bill Cowher, and former Cowboys head coach Jimmy Johnson. The class of 2021 will take center stage tomorrow. UTSA football held fall camp practice number two this morning at the race facility, and this gave us a chance to talk with junior punter Lucas Dean, who's been named to several preseason watch lists, including the Ray Guy Award. Last season, the Australian shattered the program's single-season punting average record with a 50, with the 46-yard mark, which led the league and ranked sixth nationally. Now, he told us a great story about playing in his first ever American football game. So like my first actual game was my first college game for UTSA against Incarnate Word. So like I'd never played an American a game of American football. I just like trained a lot of punting and that. And yeah, so literally my first game was my first game. It's pretty scary, but like I just had to like trust my training and like all that. Um, yeah, it's and it's definitely weird. Like all I basically knew was I run out there on fourth down. Like, I didn't know, like, so many times, like, something had happened, I'd be like, what's going on there? Like, what's going on there? Or, like, yeah, it was, it was weird, that's for sure. Now he's one of the best punters in college football, and Dean said he understands the rules much better to American football. Thank you, Larry. Oh, busy, Gerber? Sorry. <laughs> Trying to take up your time, Check, man. Checking on the Indian score. <laughs> I didn't get to see. Like, at least he's still on topic, though. No, that's true. Mine's still in Ohio. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Larry. Hey, stay with us. It's been a while since I've been able to see that, say this. Uh, finally tonight, something good. That's right. Four penguin chicks at the Shed Aquarium in Chicago have taken their first swim. Staff says that this is an important milestone in their development. The four chicks were born in April and May and haven't yet joined the rest of the aquarium's penguin colony on public display. Staff hasn't determined the sexes of the chicks and they're not yet named. The penguin chicks have been reaching additional developmental milestones, including eating fish, socializing, and exploring new spaces around the aquarium. I always think of Happy Feet when I think of penguins. <laughs> it's such a good movie. They, they certainly look like they figured out the swimming portion. They'll be joining the rest in no time. Oh, yes. They are so cute. Well, follow their lead and top in a cool body of water tomorrow. It'll be another hot day as we wrap up the weekend. Uh, breezy not only tomorrow, but for the next several afternoons, and uh, that'll help us out. We'll always take that breeze, guys. Could be worse. That is all of our time for tonight. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to catch Good Morning San Antonio tomorrow morning starting at 6. Have a good night.